So uh, this evening I'm going to talk about some aspects of uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism and Tibetan culture with which you may not be uh, familiar. Now in the West, uh, beginning in especially in 19th century and early 20th century, uh, a lot of very uh, romantic things were said about uh, Tibet. Basically because uh, at those times Tibet was still a blank space on the map and so Westerners could project all kinds of, uh, of fantasies into that blank space. This came about because in the 17th century uh, Christian missionaries started coming to Tibet. Uh, beginning with the uh, Italian Jesuit, Ippolito Desideri. Now, being a Jesuit, he was uh, quite a scholar. He learned Tibetan. He lived in Lhasa, and he even wore the robes of a Tibetan monk. And the Tibetan monks liked him very much because uh, he could speak Tibetan, and they would debate religion. However, then Capuchin monks uh, came to set up uh, another mission, and they were jealous of him, and they gave a bad report to the Pope uh, back in Italy, and he was uh, recalled. But the uh, Capuchins had no luck in converting any Tibetans to Christianity, <clears throat> so they went into the bazaar and started buying up an or orphan children, and giving them uh, Christian names, uh, uh, Thomas and Jeremiah and Benjamin and so on. Well, uh, this made the Tibetan government a bit uh, paranoid. They were already well aware of the Indian in influence in, uh, or British influence in India. And so they expelled these missionaries and closed the country down uh, to European visitors. So following that, very few Europeans actually got into Tibet, like uh, uh, Bogli in the uh, 18th century, who visited uh, Shigatse when there was a split between the Panchen Lama and the Lhasa government and so on. And uh, <coughs> at the uh, end of the uh, 19th century, Madame Blavatsky, who founded the Theosophical Society, uh, located her Masters of uh, Wisdom uh, in Tibet, and this was uh, continued then by Annie Besant and C.W. Ledbetter and so on, with many fantasies about what was going on in Tibet, but having no connection with the actual uh, culture of Tibet. But even when I first became interested in Tibet, there were books in circulation, uh, such as uh, those the, uh, like The Third Eye by T. Lobsong Rampa, who turned out to be actually a, a plumber from Plymouth uh, <laughs> and not a Tibetan Lama. But he explained this when people pointed out, hey, we remember you when you were fixing our pipes. And he said, well, he was out one day in Devon uh, collecting butterflies. In those days, some people in Devon did that. And he was up in a tree with his net. And then suddenly he reached out and fell. But just then, the spirit of Lopsang Rampa, a Tibetan Lama who had just uh, died and lost his body, was coming along. And they met and they had a conversation. And the Lama asked, well, could I uh, borrow your body for a while? And he uh, uh, agreed before he hit the ground. And so this is how he explained he had all this knowledge about the underground museums in Lhasa and thing, things like this. Well, <clears throat> I had taught in San Francisco at the Theosophical Society. And when living in India, I was uh, staying at uh, uh, Adyar uh, through the grace of uh, Rukmini Devi, who was the sister of Sri Ram, the president of the TS at that time. So I became very familiar with their uh, system. But it didn't have uh, anything very much to do with actual 
uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, <clears throat> however, uh, and this is a topic for tomorrow, Evans Wentz, who published the first uh, translations of uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which was the book that got me initially interested in Tibetan B Buddhism in those prehistoric times in the 1960s. Uh, he interpreted Tibetan Buddhism in terms of uh, theosophy, which is a Western uh, system. Madame Lavosky is a genius of her own kind, but it just wasn't Tibetan Buddhism. So this uh, persuaded me later to seek out some of these uh, Dzogchen texts. I became interested in Tibetan Buddhism much uh, uh, earlier. Uh, I wasn't uh, raised as a Christian, even though I uh, grew up in the colonies, now known as the United States. Uh, my mother was a lapsed uh, Irish Catholic who uh, left the church in a huff. And my father said, well, there's only three times in life you should go to church. That is when you get baptized, when you get married, and when they bury you. Otherwise, you stay away. So I was not raised as a Christian. Uh, I first became interested in re religion by reading Edith Hamilton's uh, mythology book. I found the Greek gods much more interesting than the Jewish and uh, Christian ones. I <clears throat> just couldn't abide that uh, Christian God who seemed like a nasty old grandfather sitting in a big chair in heaven. And Jesus, well, he was a nice guy, but he looked too much like uh, this uh, Swedish hippie in a nightshirt who was stoned. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not get involved in Christianity but I identified very strongly with uh, paganism and my great aunt Lottie, who was a painter and her husband a sculptor, he had made a magnificent statue of the Greek god Pan, which she kept in a garden uh, a shrine and that fascinated me as a child. So I was much more attuned to this pagan tradition than to our Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, that we uh, have in the West. But anyway, I began, <clears throat> I became focused on India at a later point when I was about uh, 12 years old and reading science fiction. I read a book called uh, Philosophies and Religions of India. And I could really relate to the Indian approach to spirituality. Mm -hmm as opposed to our uh, Judeo-Christian one here in the West. Uh, however, the chapter there on Buddhism only spoke about uh, monks and monasteries. And at that time, even though I was only 12 years old, I was uh, starting to become interested in girls, and so I had no interest in becoming a monk and living in a monastery. But when I went to university and read the Tibetan Book of the Dead translation, which uh, mentioned uh, Padmasambhava and uh, the Nyingmapa tradition, the oldest school of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, also this mysterious uh, philosophy of uh, Dzogchen, this really uh, caught my uh, interest. And so later I uh, shifted universities and went out to University of California where I began studying uh, Tibetan and uh, uh, Sanskrit. In those days, we didn't have any Tibetan lamas in the United States. They hadn't come yet. And uh, so there were also very few books about Tibetan Buddhism that were readily available mainly uh, the four books edited by uh, Evans Wentz and published by University of Oxford, and Lama Govinda's book uh, about the foundations of Tibetan mysticism, which it is not, as I found out later, having met a German uh, Swami in India who said he suggested that uh, topic to uh, Lama uh, 
Govinda, who did not read uh, Tibetan, but just used uh, Western sources that were available at that time. In the same way, all the remarks Madame Blavatsky made about Tibet, you can trace to books that were published in uh, her own day. So I decided I wanted to get to the original sources of the Tibetan tradition, namely uh, the Sanskrit language and the Tibetan language, uh, with the idea of eventually going to India and studying under uh, the Lamas, who were the living custodians of this uh, tradition. And of course, with uh, 1959, they began coming out of uh, Tibet when His Holiness the Dalai Lama and many other Lamas like Jawa Karmapa and Dingo Chensi Rinpoche and Duju Rinpoche uh, left their native uh, country and became uh, refugees in uh, India. Well, uh, this opened up the opportunity for Western students to have uh, direct uh, contact uh, with these uh, masters and discover what uh, Tibetan Buddhism was uh, really about. So when uh, I wanted to continue my Tibetan studies, I went to the University of Washington. And at that time, Dejong Rinpoche was there as a, an informant at the university and fortuitously uh, my wife and I, at the time, uh, moved in the house uh, next door to him. So I got to sit in on many pujas uh, with, with him and received my first empowerments for Padmasambhava, Avalokiteshvara, Tara, and uh, uh, so on. And of course, also then uh, studying Tibetan language at the university. And at the same time, uh, Professor Edward Kansa, uh, came there to teach, and I became uh, uh, his student for uh, some years until uh, the Americans expelled him from uh, America uh, due to his anti-Nazi activities in, in the past, and uh, uh, which uh, ended my program there. And then I went to uh, India in 1969, and uh, then spent a, a lot of time in Darjeeling among the uh, Tibetans there and discovered that Tibetan Buddhism wasn't very much like what it said in the books. Now in Tibet, uh, <clears throat> there are uh, more than one re religious uh, tradition. Of course, there is uh, uh, Buddhism, which originated uh, in India and was brought to Tibet beginning in the 7th and 8th uh, uh, century. But there's also the Bon tradition and uh, uh, something that has no name, but uh, basically uh, Tibetan uh, folk tradition, which also uh, continues. And uh, this folk tradition uh, has many elements which are closely connected with the practice of uh, uh, shamanism, that is Central Asian and North Asian uh, shamanism. Uh, the term shaman, as some of you may know, uh, is actually a Tungus word, a tribe in Siberia. And it was first... Uh, as a practice described by uh, Russian a anthropologists. And uh, uh, then uh, they found similar practices uh, uh, elsewhere in different par parts of the world, including among uh, Native Americans. And many considered a definitive book on the subject to have been written by a scholar of comparative re religion from Romania, uh, Mercia Eliada. Uh, and the title of that book is uh, uh, Shamanism, in which he points out the uh, basic uh, defining element is shamanism 
is that the individual practitioner enters into an altered uh, state of consciousness where that individual can communicate with uh, dimensions beyond our uh, immediate experience. Uh, that is the other world of uh, the spirits. And uh, <clears throat> this is a practice that continues uh, among the uh, Tibetans. However, in Tibetan society, shamanism is not a separate re religion from uh, Buddhism or Bon. Uh, all of the Tibetan shamans I have met personally have been uh, Nyingmapa Buddhists, uh, belonging to the Nyingmapa school of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. But I've also heard about Bonpo uh, uh, shamans uh, in Tibet it itself. Uh, <clears throat> and there are practitioners uh, today who we would consider to be uh, classical uh, shamans, uh, both inside Tibet and in the Himalayan uh, region of uh, Nepal and uh, Bhutan. And uh, <clears throat> In the view of the t Tibetans, uh, nature, wild nature, is filled with uh, spirits. Uh, there are legends that there were ten races of spirits who ruled in Tibet uh, before uh, humans took over the, uh, the place. According to the usual Buddhist story, uh, in the time of uh, the Buddha, uh, there was a great lake in Tibet, and then that began to recede, and there were a lot of uh, monkeys around living in the trees and so on. And the great uh, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshva uh, reincarnated as a monkey king to start uh, uh, teaching them uh, uh, how to live properly, and uh, he entered into a relationship with a uh, Draxinmo or uh, uh, a rock uh, ogress, a kind of female uh, demon. And uh, they got together and gave uh, birth uh, to the first uh, Tibetans. Uh, this was a Buddhist story, but the Bompos and the folk tradition have different stories of the origin of the uh, Tibetan people. Now, the medieval uh, Tibetan histories, which were written by B Buddhist monks, of course, they are attempting to glorify uh, the introduction of uh, Indian Buddhism into Tibet as being the source of all uh, civilization, so that they represented the Tibetans as being very uncultured and uncivilized before Buddhism came. But this uh, wasn't true at all, because there was an old tradition there, uh, which the, these histories called Bon, now, or Perm. And this is a word that perhaps comes from an old verb, Bondpa, meaning to uh, call the spirits or to invoke uh, uh, the gods, and it also translates uh, the Zhangzhong word jer, which uh, has a, si a similar meaning. But some scholars have pointed out that uh, in a Central Asian Buddhist texts, particularly in the Sogdian language, uh, the word used to translate the Sanskrit word dharma is uh, bun. So maybe it could also come from there, because the Bompo Lamas claim that their traditions originated in Tazik or uh, uh, Central Asia, and that at a, a later point were brought to the kingdom of Zhangzhong and then to uh, uh, Central uh, Tibet. Now, uh, until re recently, most Western scholars kind of uh, poo-pooed this, and said, oh, those uh, Bumpo Lamas, they just invented this Zhangzhong language to have something like the, the Buddhists have the Sanskrit. But now, uh, Zhangzhong texts have been uh, turning up, 
and uh, in that language. And also the Chinese have been discovering some inscriptions uh, in, in that uh, language. And the archaeological survey of John, uh, my friend John Babaleza, have well established that uh, there was this uh, Zhangzhong kingdom in existence before Buddhism came to central Tibet, that is before the uh, 8th uh, century. And it was mainly centered in western Tibet around uh, uh, Mount uh, uh, Kailas. And to the west of that, there was a city known as uh, Chonglung, the uh, Garuda Valley. And there's many ruins there. And in earlier days, the climate was a bit different than now. So there was more rainfall and so on. They did terrace uh, agriculture and so on. Now it's just too arid and it's just inhabited by nomads. But thousands of years ago, it seems to have been a, a, a bit uh, different. Some Tibetan scholars like uh, Namkain Obu Rinpoche pointed out that this is a real source of uh, Tibetan civilization that goes back earlier than contact with uh, India and China that Tibetans should stop thinking that everything just uh, uh, derives from uh, Buddhism in India in terms of their uh, uh, culture. So uh, more and more evidence is uh, coming for, uh, forth for this. And of course, this is asserted uh, by the um, Bonpo Lamas. But this term, uh, when it was used in the 7th and 8th century, was a bit general. And uh, it could mean many different kinds of spiritual practitioners, uh, some of whom were shamans in uh, uh, a classical sense. But uh, uh, others were probably ritualists, uh, magicians, and uh, 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 priests. Uh, and, but some of them were uh, connected with the uh, religious uh, tradition of the uh, Zhangzhong kingdom when that was finally conquered by the central Tibetans in the 8th century in the time of uh, the great Buddhist king, Te Tisong Detsen, and sort of uh, put an end to uh, that uh, culture as something uh, separate from Tibet. But there was a Zhangzhong language, which is quite similar to Tibetan, but it's not exactly uh, Tibetan. And they had a system of writing which existed earlier uh, than uh, the usual Tibetan writing, but which was, was also a source for the uh, Ume uh, uh, script in Tibetan. And it is asserted that they were uh, many books that were translated from the uh, Zhangzhong language into the Tibetan language. And uh, at least one of these, uh, the Sipa Zerpuk, has survived in the original Zhangzhong language and then with the Tibetan translation to that and then a commentary on this by Drenpa Namka, who was a disciple of Guru Padmasambhava in the uh, 8th century. <clears throat> but uh, the Bumpo tradition then emerged at the end of the uh, 10th century along with the Nyingmapa uh, tradition. But in both cases, it largely passed through uh, family lineages or clans uh, and with uh, married lamas. It was with the revival of monastic uh, practice in the 11th century that monasteries began being built uh, again, uh, <clears throat> that having uh, come to an end with the persecution of uh, Buddhism uh, pre previously. And at that time, the Nyingmapas and Bumpas also uh, began uh, building their monasteries. Now, <clears throat> according to the traditions coming from Zhang Zhong, now known as uh, Yongdrung Ban, 
to distinguish it from other types of uh, uh, religious practice in Tibetan folk uh, tra tradition. It was established by a Buddha who existed in prehistoric times in Central Asia, known as Tazik, uh, coming from the land of uh, Omalungrin. Of course, there's quite a debate about where this was located. Some people say Central Asia. Uh, it's a general belief among Bumpo Lamas, other scholars saying, oh, it's the Mount Kailas region and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but it is said that uh, Trungpa Shenra, the founder of this uh, tra tradition, uh, visited uh, Tibet on one occasion. He'd been uh, living in Oma Lungring, and he had eight sons and two daughters. And those two daughters, uh, they liked to go out uh, dancing, whatever discos were like in those days. And uh, the youngest one met this very tall, dark, and handsome man who was actually a demon prince in disguise, Kakpa Lukring. And uh, he su uh, succeeded in seducing her, and she became pregnant and gave uh, birth to two boys. So uh, her father, Tenpa Shenrup, he didn't approve of this at all. So he went to the demon kingdom and he brought the, uh, his daughter and <coughs> her two sons uh, back to Oma Lungring. And uh, the demon prince was very angry about this. So he succeeded in stealing the seven horses of Tenpa Shenrup. And uh, he took them to Kongpo in uh, southeastern Tibet and uh, hid them there with the help of the local uh, chief in uh, Kongpo. Uh, the human beings at that time lived rather primitively in caves and uh, so on. Well, uh, then uh, Tendra, Tendra Shenrub journeyed to Tibet and then to Kongpo and got into a magical battle with Jepra uh, Lukring. Uh, and they did things like uh, throw mountains at each other and so on, which they did in those, those days, one of them being uh, over here. And Trungpa um, Shenrup took one big mountain and boom, and threw it down there, changed the course of the river. And that became Kongpo Bonri, uh, which is a sacred mountain to the uh, Bompos. Well, eventually, Tenpa Shenrup triumphed in these battles, and Kekpa Lukring was forced to uh, become his uh, disciple. Now, because human beings were rather in a primitive situation in Tibet in those days, there was no point in teaching them the higher spiritual uh, practices of uh, Sutra Tantra and Dzogchen, <coughs> which have the ultimate aim of attaining Buddha enlightenment and uh, liberation from suffering and samsara, this being the ultimate uh, spiritual goal in both Buddhism and Bon. Uh, <coughs> but since they were having all kinds of problems with uh, uh, evil spirits and demons and so on, Tun Pashanrup uh, taught them the uh, arts of uh, shamanism in particular, Hlasurwa, how to invoke uh, positive uh, energies from the gods and from higher spiritual uh, dimensions and call that down into our uh, human world. He taught them uh, Trepa, uh, how to uh, exercise uh, negative influences and the evil spirits. And he taught them Yanguk, how to summon um, prosperity. And so this is one account of how shamanism then began in uh, t Tibet. And he prophesied that in some time in the future, his higher spiritual teachings would be uh, brought from Zhangshan to Tibet. And that occurred in the time of the 
second uh, king of the Yarlung Valley, uh, which was an ancestor to the Tibetan line of kings. His name was Mutrit Sampo. And it said that some Bompo Lamas came from Zhangzhou there and uh, taught the tantric practices known as the uh, Qipeng. Now, <coughs> the uh, Bompo uh, scriptures are uh, classified according to ve various ways. And one of them is the Four Doorways of Bon. And basically, they are practices uh, relating to shamanism, uh, sutra, tantra, and dzogchen. Now, <clears throat> it's very interesting, uh, these rituals that we find here, which are uh, definitely shamanic, that is, uh, dealing with the relationship between human beings and the, the spirits of uh, the uh, other world. And... Uh, because normally uh, uh, we find shamanism among uh, tribal peoples, often uh, supporting themselves from hunting and gathering and uh, so on. And uh, pre preliterate, they haven't, until recent times, haven't recorded their uh, shamanic tra traditions. But uh, the Tibetans early developed the habit of uh, writing everything down. This includes the so-called uh, upadeshas or secret oral instructions they got from Indian teachers, which were supposed to be oral, but the uh, Tibetans uh, wrote them all down. So nowadays, uh, uh, these may be secret teachings, but you can go to university libraries and you can find them all there in books uh, if you can read Tibetan. Otherwise, they're no, uh, not much help. Uh, anyway, we have all these uh, various kinds of uh, rituals for uh, uh, propitiating and re relating to the uh, spirits. And uh, when Buddhism came to Tibet, uh, many of these were integrated into the Buddhist tradition uh, as well. And... Uh, so we have uh, uh, practices like uh, uh, Chutor, Song, Sur, and so on, and uh, uh, magical practices like uh, De and Lud and so on, which you find the oldest examples in Bumpo texts, but you find them then in Buddhist texts, and usually uh, attributed to uh, Padmasambhava. Now, in the uh, 8th century, the Tibetan king uh, Tisong Daitsen decided to uh, uh, introduce Buddhism into his uh, country. Because at that time, Tibet was surrounded on every side by uh, Buddhist countries, such as in China, in the east, Nepal, and India in the south, and Central Asia in, in the west. And uh, thinking like a Buddhist, uh, then, uh, well, to have Buddhism, you have to have monks and monasteries. So he invited a monk scholar from India, uh, Shantarakshita, and uh, brought him to Tibet, and he ordained the first seven native-born uh, Tibetan monks and uh, introduce the uh, Vinaya, the monastic discipline, and the sutra system in, in, of Mahayana, uh, including the Madhyamaka f philosophy. But then a problem developed because the uh, king would have his workers come out every day and start erecting the walls of uh, Samye Monastery uh, but then every night, the local gods and spirits would come out and tear the walls down again. And this was because uh, in those days, uh, to propitiate the Hadre, the local god, gods and spirits, uh, Tibetans would uh, sacrifice animals, much like what was done here in Europe uh, before the 
uh, uh, Christian church came here. Now, when you sacrifice a living animal, and this is also what the ancient uh, Greeks and Romans did, uh, you slit its throat and its blood flows on the altar. And this liberates their life force or prana into the atmosphere. And the local spirits then come and feed upon the, this uh, energy. And they become uh, addicted to this, uh, much like a, a junkie becomes addicted to his dope. And so the local gods and spirits in Tibet, they didn't want these Buddhist monks coming up there because they were opposed to this uh, practice. Uh, in the time of the Buddha, a thousand years uh, be before that, uh, there were many nature spirits, uh, very active in uh, uh, India, in his region, uh, known as uh, Yakshas, often uh, uh, associated with uh, trees. And these nature spirits controlled the fertility of the earth and uh, so on. And uh, the uh, peasants in those days would also uh, sacrifice li living animals uh, to them. Uh, but the Buddha had taught the sacredness of life and that this uh, practice of taking life was not good. So his followers uh, opposed this practice of yajna or uh, sacrificing uh, uh, animals. But still you had to deal with these uh, local nature spirits. And so they came up with the idea of a, a vegan or vegetarian substitute. That is, <clears throat> you take grain and you make this uh, into a uh, cake and you paint this uh, red with a ve vegetable dye and then you offer this uh, to the spirits as a substitute for a blood sacrifice. Now you might think the spirits are a little stupid uh, to be taken in by, by this, but the spirits are actually not feeding on the material out of which the torma or offering cake is made. They are feeding on the energy which has been projected into it by uh, the lamas or the uh, Buddhist monks. Because you consecrate these torma. First you uh, cleanse it, removing uh, impurities, and then you purify it with uh, uh, your visualization. And then you invoke from a higher uh, source spiritual energies and bring that down into the torma cake. And it's on that energy which the uh, spirits uh, feed. Now, this is still uh, a matter of, matter of uh, debate in Nepal where Tibetan Buddhism comes into contact with indigenous shaman, shamanism of uh, uh, people like uh, Tamangs and uh, Gurungs and so on. Because some shamans insist the uh, spirits know the difference and the Buddhists say, no, 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 they're feeding on the energy so the torma cake is fine. <laughs> and also, we had a debate in New York some years ago because I have friends who are uh, Santeros involved in uh, Santeria, which is uh, African-American uh, re religion coming from uh, Cuba. And uh, in this practice also, you need to occasionally sacrifice a chicken or a goat or, or something like this. Well, if you become involved with Buddhism, then this is a little uh, difficult. Uh, but in our group there, we found that uh, we could also use torma cakes for some of these uh, African deities. Uh, Erzuli and Shango had no problem with, with this. So, uh, Tibetan Lamas then claimed that uh, 
the practice of martyr sacrificing animals, which uh, shamans would sometimes do, uh, was eliminated in uh, Tibet. Of course, this is not, not quite true because uh, uh, the Tibetans also have their uh, hypocrisy. Now, here in the Christian West, our hypocrisy is about sex, that we have these uh, pure priests and saints and so on who uh, totally uh, renounce sex and so on, but our culture is totally obsessed with, with, with this. Uh, among Tibetans, it's the eating of meat. Uh, to do a high tantric practice known as the Gana Puja, you have to have meat, alcohol, and uh, women present, or dakinis uh, present. Well, uh, this creates a problem because, well, uh, for first of all, uh, alcohol, uh, there is a rule for monks you can't drink alcohol. Well, they came up with a solution similar to the Catholic Church uh, because uh, when you go to high mass, the priest transmutes the alcohol there into something else. Uh, this is what uh, they uh, do in uh, uh, Buja, that the, it starts out as alcohol, but then you transmute it into amrita nectar, and so then the monks can sit there and drink a lot of it, and they're not drinking alcohol. Next thing, uh, meat eating. Well, there's no general rule uh, for uh, Buddhists about meat eating. I mean, some like uh, Chinese monks, uh, they're totally ve vegetarian, but uh, Tibetans aren't. But the old rule from India was the monk goes around with a begging bowl and he eats what he is given. So even if a leopard's, uh, leopard's finger drops in there, he's supposed to eat that too. Uh, so Tibetans don't have any trouble about uh, eating meat inside their momos and that. But the problem is, where does this meat come from? Well, nowadays, uh, you go down the road here and you, you buy it in Tesco's. No, no problem. But they didn't have Tesco's in Lhasa. But they had Muslim butchers. Because Muslims don't have any problem about killing animals. But there weren't that many Muslim butchers in Tibet. And uh, somebody kills all those animals there that Tibetans are eating their, their meat. So... You just think and think about that. And then the final thing, uh, Dakini's pre present at the Ganapuja. Well, uh, the way they got around that was to start practicing uh, the higher Tantra in the style of the lower uh, uh, Tantra. They still have uh, uh, alcohol instead of grape, uh, grape juice and meat instead of tofu although uh, some Western Buddhists now are doing this, but then it's not a real Gana Puja. Uh, but what to do in this all-male society where you're not supposed to have any wet women there? Well, they came up with the idea of a yikirikma, an imaginary woman. So you have these fat monks uh, sitting there and they have their pages and they're looking at, and they're chanting, you know, with a beautiful deep voice. <laughs> Uh, like, like that. But if you can read Tibetan, the description is they have these beautiful naked 16 year old girls dancing in front of them. <laughs> because that creates certain sensations and feelings in the normal male. Of course, if the monk is gay, then maybe he has to visualize boys, but that, that's okay. Uh, but it's all on the mind, and therefore it's okay because you don't have actual women in the Gangana Puja. Well, that was one way uh, to get around. Anyway, <clears throat> they had this problem with uh, gods and spirits. So what, what to do? Shanti Rakshita said, well, I'm just a monk and a scholar. I'm not any good at dealing with uh, gods and spirits, but I have a friend. 
and he's living in a cave south of Kathmandu right now, together with his Nepali girlfriend. And if you invite him here, he's a tantrika. He's a specialist in dealing with problems with God, gods and spirits. And his name's Padmasambhava. And so uh, the king invited him. Well, Padmasambhava had his third eye of wisdom open, so he knew that uh, the king was sending down a de delegation of ministers with uh, a lot of gold dust to invite him. And so he set off uh, to meet them, and when he met them, he just took the gold dust and threw it in the air. He didn't need it. Uh, and then he continued and crossed the high passes into Tibet. And up ahead, he saw this big uh, snow mountain called Yar Yarlashambo. That was the name of uh, the god li living on top of that uh, uh, mountain. And uh, Yarlashambo looked down and he saw this uh, Padmasambhava coming into Tibet. And he thought, no way is this Buddhist coming into my territory. And so he transformed himself into a giant white yak. You know, uh, yaks are big and hairy and have horns like, like this and so on. And he charged down the mountain at Padmasambhava. And it looked much like uh, one of these avalanches you see in, in Switzerland. And uh, Padmasambhava looked up and he saw this and he thought, oh, that's just Yarlashambo, no big deal. And he reached out and grabbed Yarlashambo by the snout of his nose and threw him around his head like this and then down on the ground, which uh, uh, created such an earthquake, it was felt all the way to Kathmandu and terrified the tourists. <coughs> And then Yarlashambo transformed himself into a more presentable human form and begged Padmasambhava uh, to spare his life. And Padmasambhava said, okay, under two conditions. You stop sending down avalanches and hailstorms and blizzards and all this thing, terrible things on you human beings. And secondly, you become a protector of my dhar dharma teaching. And Yarlashambo agreed to do this. And so then he became the first uh, guardian or uh, Dharma pre uh, protector. Uh, Padmasambhava then went and met the king who explained the problem with the local gods and spirits. And so Padmasambhava toured around Tibet, uh, occasionally rearranging mountains and rivers uh, to make uh, better suited for human uh, ha habitation, and uh, then engaging in magical combat with various god gods and spirits, and defeating them, he placed them under fierce oaths to henceforth become protectors of the Buddhist teachings. And so then uh, Padmasambhava became the archetypal shaman uh, for the uh, Tibetans who subdued all the wild spirits of uh, uh, nature. So this is uh, a way of including the old pagan deities of uh, uh, Tibet uh, into the Buddhist pantheon or uh, the Buddhist uh, mandala. Because in pre-Buddhist days, uh, the country was ruled by Yula, or mountain gods. Uh, in the old uh, shamanic cosmology, you have uh, three zones in the world. You have uh, the heavens above and the, the atmosphere. You have the surface of the earth and you have uh, beneath the earth. So in the heavens and the sky, there live uh, Fahla which we usually translate as uh, gods, and they came to be identified with the Indian devas. Uh, we then have the Nyan, who are the uh, powerful uh, gods on the surface of the earth, connected with the forest and the mountains and so on, became identified with the Indian uh, Yakshas. As I said, uh, in the time of the Buddha, this was the usual name for uh, na nature spirits. Uh, 
and then uh, the under in the underworld and also in bodies of water, lakes, rivers, and so on, you have the Lu, and they became identified with the Indian uh, Nagas. In India, uh, Nagas are shapeshifters. They can appear as uh, snakes or of half human and half snake or fully human. And occasionally, uh, in ancient times at least, they could uh, mate with uh, human beings and became the founders of some dynasties and, and so on. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, in, in Tibet, Nagas can have uh, forms uh, other than those of uh, uh, snakes. Anyway, on the surface uh, of the earth, any area would be ruled over by a Yula mountain god, which would be the highest mountain in, in, in that area. And he is mated with the local Menmo or uh, lake uh, goddess. So then they become a kind of a, a, a pair. And he rules over all the Shidak, uh, the local uh, spirits for that particular uh, region. And in Tibetan folk re religion, uh, these uh, Yula uh, continue to uh, exist and be propitiated. Some of them have been taken into the Buddhist uh, pantheon, actually, like I mentioned, Yar Yarla Shambo, but there's others like uh, uh, Tangla and Bomrache and so on, <coughs> which are not only mountains, but they're also uh, gar uh, Dharma protectors or guardian spirits of the uh, Buddhist teachings. <clears throat> and so uh, there's many stories for these deities. Now, uh, sometimes these mountain deities uh, communicate with uh, human beings through various uh, omens and signs, but also through dreams, and sometimes by um, possessing uh, someone in a community, which it forces that individual to become a, uh, a shaman. So traditional shamanism also continues to be practiced among uh, Tibetans in Tibet and also among refugees outside of uh, uh, Tibet. But as I explained, it's not anymore a separate uh, religious tradition as it is, for example, in many areas in the Himalayas or in uh, Mongolia, where the uh, Gelugpa Lamas there do not accept the shamanism as a, a Buddhist uh, practice. But in Tibet, by and large it has, although some shamans are looked down upon by the monks if they are just being uh, possessed by a local mountain god, but if they become uh, possessed by an official uh, guardian spirit, uh, then it's okay. For example, when I was uh, living in uh, Boda, in Nepal, we had a, a shamaness from uh, uh, Ladakh named Dolkar, and she would get um, possessed by the guardian spirit Yudurma, the lady of the turquoise uh, land. And uh, she would go into an altered state of consciousness, and then Yudurma would uh, speak through her. Sometimes it would, could be other spirits, but may, mainly that. And um, Yudunma is a, a recognized uh, uh, Dharma protector or uh, guardian in the uh, Buddhist uh, tradition. And it, it's similar uh, among the uh, Bampos, particularly around uh, uh, Kongpo Bonri, but I haven't been there my, myself, so I haven't had any personal uh, co <coughs> connection. But as I say, in Nepal, when I came into contact with practicing uh, Tibetan sh uh, shamans, uh, they belong to the Nyingmapa tradition. 
And so when they had a, a churchum or an altar, they would have a uh, panka of Guru pa Padmasambhava and other uh, uh, Buddhist uh, deities. Now, <clears throat> Tibetan shaman is called uh, uh, Halaba, uh, particularly in uh, Ladakh and in Kham or Eastern Tibet. Uh, <clears throat> So-called because the guardian spirit that takes possession of, of them is a uh, hla. Now, hla is a very general term in Tibetan, so it can mean, you know, like the atmospheric and celestial gods, but also just in general a, a spirit. So, for example, as a human being, we have these five sungma uh, hla, uh, or guardian spirits, who are with us since the time of our uh, birth. For uh, example, uh, we have our uh, Sokla, who sits above our heart. He's the guardian spirit of our uh, Sok, or life force, that's Sanskrit prana. Uh, we have our uh, Pola, which is the guardian spirit of our father's uh, lineage, and he sits uh, underneath the uh, right arm. And the Mogla, the guardian spirit of our female lineage, and he sits under the uh, le left arm. We have our Yula, uh, who sits on top of our head and is the guardian of our uh, social status and re reputation in uh, society. And then uh, men have a Drala, a warrior god, who sits on our right shoulder and protects our right arm which wields the sword and, and so on. But then a lady can have a menmo on her left shoulder who uh, guards all her uh, feminine uh, qualities. <coughs> so law can also mean a spirit in, in general. But in central Tibet, in southern uh, Tibet, shaman is usually called a, a pawo uh, because that's the spirit who takes possession of the uh, shaman and uh, <coughs> uh, speaks through the shaman as a uh, medium. Now, generally shamanism here manifests in terms of uh, uh, spirit uh, possession. And uh, this is usually occurs involuntarily it may go through a fam family lineage, but not ne necessarily. And it's unlike here in the West, where we have New Age shamanism, where people take a workshop and all of a sudden they're uh, a shaman. Or I remember in California, you know, every time you turned over a rock, you'd find another shaman there. <laughs> because uh, Carlos Castaneda's books became so popular that uh, everyone was being a shaman. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, shamanic vocation, not necessarily a very pleasant I I experience because it often uh, comes at the time of uh, adolescence when people are uh, puberty, when people are undergoing changes and they go a little crazy and run off into the wilderness and do strange things and uh, so on and then their family takes them to an older shaman who uh, then uh, teaches them how to uh, uh, shamanize. But anyway, uh, they then develop this uh, capacity to enter into a personal re relationship with the uh, spirits. So if uh, someone in the Tibetan community falls ill, they might uh, then call in a faba or pao, and they first have to make a diagnosis of what is the source, that is the spirit that is uh, causing this uh, problem or this illness. Now usually uh, this happens because someone has done something that has injured or offended the uh, spirits. In an old uh, Bumpo book like the Lubum, 
Uh, it tells all of these stories that uh, when civilization developed, particularly agriculture, people then began changing uh, the landscape, you know, by uh, building roads and houses or damming streams or cutting down trees and so on. And wild nature is considered the home of these uh, spirits, and they become offended when you, human beings uh, do this. Now, <clears throat> each of us has our uh, uh, one tongue or personal energy field, which in modern terms we'd say would be connected with our immune system. And when that's strong, uh, we can resist provocations of negative energy, dun, which can be sent against us by uh, spirits. But when that is weakened, then that ne negative energy can enter into our uh, aura, and it's possible that we uh, fall sick. And so the shaman then uh, does various divinations uh, to try and discover which spirit or which class of spirits have been offended, uh, beginning with uh, tra. Tra means uh, gazing into a mirror uh, to get a vision, much like uh, old gypsy ladies would lo look in a, a crystal ball. And so on the shamanic altar, you have three mirrors, uh, these Tibetan-style mirrors, not our Western mirrors which is, uh, you know, around and, and polished like this and set on a, a stand. And uh, they represent these uh, three zones of the uh, shamanic universe, the Hla and the Tsen, the earth spirits, and the La, the sky spirit, the Tsen, earth spirits, and the Lu, uh, the water and underworld uh, spirits. And the shaman may get a vision in in one of one of these mirrors of the uh, spirit who's become uh, offended. Fun, maybe not, but uh, he then uh, does the uh, ceremony with the uh, the big shaman's uh, drum and the uh, chanting, and also uh, he or she will have to have an assistant to do it. Because when the uh, shaman goes into trance or altered state of consciousness, uh, he or she cannot uh, continue chanting and drumming anymore. So the assistant uh, continues uh, doing this. And uh, then the shaman has this experience of his or her namshe, meaning consciousness, going up from the heart, up through the central channel, a bit like Poa, and out the top of the head, and in this uh, rainbow tunnel, going into one of these uh, mirrors. And then the spirit guide of the shaman comes and takes uh, possession, and then <coughs> begins, can speak through uh, the shaman as a... Uh, medium. And when you see this happen, it's quite <coughs> quite unusual because it's a different person there now. The voice changes, the expression, everything. It's not the same person as it was um, before. But the spirit guide then diagnoses the cause of the illness and then prescribes a toe or a healing ritual for this uh, uh, problem. And of course the assistant then interrogates uh, the uh, spirit guide in relation to what kind of uh, practice uh, should, should be uh, done. Because uh, also uh, this may entail uh, the practice of a tseguk, that is recalling life energy, which has been somehow fragmented or lost, and also laguk, uh, that is uh, retrieving the soul or fragments of the soul, which have somehow become lost or dissipated or even stolen by uh, 
evil uh, spirits. And uh, so there may have to be performed some sort of ransom ceremony, a loot or even a dirt, which is much more a elaborate uh, ceremony on behalf of the patient who's been uh, sick. And then the spirit guide uh, leaves the uh, shaman and the regular personality returns, but very often the shaman uh, at this time has uh, really been depleted of, of energy and will almost fall in to be uh, collapsed or something. But sometimes uh, one can just uh, do these uh, uh, rituals without the shamanic uh, ex, uh, aspect to it, such as lamas uh, do. We had one example when I was first uh, studying in Seattle. This uh, Tibetan family uh, bought a house there, and they suddenly had problems with a shin or a, a noisy ghost, a poltergeist. And all kinds of crazy things were happening in, in the house, strange noises inside the walls, and things falling off, and, and this. So they called in uh, my first lama, De Dejung Rinpoche, who did some <coughs> de divinations, and he determined that uh, a shin was I involved in, in this, the spirit of a deceased uh, person. And so he uh, performed the dirt ritual, which is the uh, creating of a uh, spirit trap, which is uh, an elaborate uh, uh, stru uh, structure. And inside there's ransoms and so on, images uh, placed in this. And uh, he did this uh, for the entire night. And then before dawn, he took this dirt out to the crossroads because the Tibetan belief when the rays of sun uh, hit the dirt, it, uh, the spirit that's causing the problem is invoked into this structure, this spirit trap. And uh, when the rays of the sun strike it, then uh, the spirit is released and being in the crossroads can't find its way uh, back to the house uh, which it's been haunting and therefore uh, can <coughs> go off uh, into the bardo and hopefully to a, a better rebirth. Now this kind of spirit is also called a, a yidak or, or preta. And it's characterized by obsessive, repeated activities over and over again. Once when I was living in Devon, uh, several times I met this uh, uh, ghost in the house of uh, a woman looking like she came out of the 18th century and would just go by like this. A bit spooky, but not dangerous. Anyway, uh, the, these things uh, uh, happen, and one Lama explained to me, oh, in the old days we had a lot of problems with Shin in Tibetan, in Tibet, and so we had to be careful when somebody died uh, that for some time after that we would always set a place for them at the table with a little food there and so on. So if they were still around, uh, they would feel good and wouldn't cause uh, uh, problems. So uh, shamanism then as a practice does uh, continue uh, among the uh, Tibetans, but mainly the lamas uh, as uh, uh, priests have come to usurp the role of the uh, old-style uh, shamans, and they uh, do many uh, rituals, because ri ritual is one way of uh, working with uh, energies. And the most uh, 
popular ritual done by uh, Tibetan lamas is called a Tse Wang. Uh, Tse means life energy and Wang means empowerment. So this can be used for uh, healing if someone is sick, but also just to bring good fortune and good luck and so on to, so, uh, to someone or to uh, a group of uh, uh, people. In Tibet, there is no marriage ceremony as such, like uh, here in the uh, West, as I said, uh, Buddhist priests don't do weddings, they do funerals. They're experts in that. Because they have left the worldly life, you know. <coughs> but Tibetans still get married. So the usual way that Tibetans getting married is you throw a party and you're announced uh, you're married. Uh, if there is uh, a lot of money or property involved, then there's contracts signed first, uh, which shows what belongs to what individual. But nevertheless, they might invite a lama there to do a, a tsewang, but a tsewang as such is not a marriage cer uh, ceremony. But it brings uh, good fortune and positive energy to everyone who uh, re receives it. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, when uh, Tibetans go to lamas, what they're mainly asking for is a uh, mo, a, a divination about uh, what will happen in the future. If, if they do such and such, how will that work out? Or some uh, problem or uh, some... Uh, it's not like uh, Westerners where we go to lamas and we say, Rinpoche, please give us some teaching. Uh, no, they, they want to mo and they want to say what. Because you have lamas and you have ordinary people. And uh, uh, ordinary people are very busy uh, uh, earning a, a, a living. And so it's uh, much like any uh, tra traditional uh, society. Uh, <clears throat> now, I particularly became involved with the Nyingmapa school because of my interest in Dzogchen and Padmasambhava and uh, uh, so on. But when I first went to Darjeeling, I met uh, Kala Rinpoche and received a lot of uh, empowerment and teaching from him and later Jawa Karmapa, and found that particularly in Darjeeling, many lamas uh, called themselves uh, Nyingma Kaju. They were doing both. It was no problem. There wasn't any of this silly sectarianism we, we get now. You know, that, oh, don't go to any other Lama, you know, except our center because you'll just get confused, blah, blah, blah. Uh, when uh, His Holiness Karmapa came and gave the Kajungatsu Wang there in Bodha, uh, <clears throat> which are all the Wangs or empowerments that come from Marpa Lotsua, uh, I went to du Dujum Rinpoche, who was my root root Lama, told him about this. He said, oh, great. Yeah, play. you should go. Yes. And then he told me, oh, yeah. And there's three books which are background for this, and you should get them. And he gave me the names and so on. And so there wasn't this terrible sectarianism that, that we, we, we now have. And uh, Dujum Rinpoche was my first uh, Dzogchen teacher. But he was teaching from his uh, Terma tradition, which is Dzogchen Upadesha. And, uh, but it gave a direct introduction to Rigpa and to the nature of mind and that. But then from Namka Norbu Rinpoche, then I received the Dzogchen Desum uh, because he covered the whole history of the development of Dzogchen in Tibet. Uh, Sem day, long day, and Manaki day. And that was uh, wonderful. And uh, later, uh, initially, because uh, Namkai Norbu got me interested in Bon as the pre Buddhist culture in uh, Tibet, and because I had uh, 
gone to uh, Locus Chandra's Institute in Delhi and bought this uh, copy in Tibetan of the Zhangju Nenju, the oral tradition of uh, uh, Dzogchen, which was one of uh, the books that uh, Lopan Tenzing Namdo brought with him out of Tibet when he escaped in 1960. Uh, this got me interested in uh, Bampo Dzogchen. I found uh, Bampo Dzogchen uh, no different from Nyingma Pa Dzogchen, it's just Dzogchen. It's just the nature of, of mind, and it's just uh, Rigpa. And so then I uh, also uh, translated many uh, Dzogchen texts from the Bampo tradition as well as from the uh, Nyingmapa tradition, and I felt very strongly that I was part of this uh, Rime or non sectarian tradition which came from Eastern Tibet in the, in that, especially in the 19th century, the 19th and early 20th, 20th century. Uh, Rime means non sectarian. Uh, <coughs> There had been the great synthesis made in central Tibet by uh, the followers of uh, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, and this you find in the Gelugpa school. But then in the uh, 18th century, there was a lot of uh, sectarian uh, conflict and intervention of Mongol armies and looting of monasteries and things like this. And partly as a reaction to this, in the 19th century, <coughs> three lamas, Jangya, Kensi Wangpo, who was Sakifa, <coughs> Jonggon Kongchul, who was uh, uh, Kajupa, although he came from a Bompo family, and Chokcha Lingpa, who was Nyingmapa, and a Tertan, who received many uh, Tertans. Uh, they're the source of this non-sectarian uh, movement, which brought in uh, other lamas like Mipam Rinpoche and some like uh, Shardza Rinpoche, who was a Bump Bumpo Lama and so on. And my own first teacher, Dejung Rinpoche, he came uh, out of this, because although being <coughs> a Sakyapa Lama, I was interested in Nyingmapa, and so that's what I was uh, studying with him. And the first book we read together was the Kunsan Lama Shalom, which was uh, Papa Rinpoche's uh, uh, commentary on the uh, Ngundra from the Longchen Yingtik. And of course, then uh, the Ngundra became very popular here in the West, particularly because of Kala Rinpoche and the uh, Karmakaju school. Uh, because Kala Rinpoche had been the Tsampan for 12 years, that is the retreat house master at Palpung Mo Monastery in e Eastern uh, Tibet. So of course he emphasized uh, that three-year retreat practice and so on. But when I was first with Dujim Rinpoche in Kalampong in Darjeeling, uh, the word Ngundro never passed his lips. But people here in the West became obsessed with it. But in Tibet, there was no office who certified who was a, a Lama, because uh, this term Lama, uh, basically it translates the Sanskrit word guru. Uh, it means a spiritual teacher who has disciples, or whatever kind of spiritual teacher that, that may be. There was no Lama office. It isn't like you did a three-year retreat and you got a red hat and then you could call yourself uh, a, a Lama. This is a kind of uh, modern idea which came up. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I've been able to say uh, a little bit about uh, uh, shamanism, but... Uh, also, when I was with Dujim Rinpoche, and particularly, I spent two years with uh, Jimmy Riggs and Rinpoche, uh, who was uh, mainly a tantrika, and he taught me a lot about uh, magical 
uh, uh, practices, saying that there's basically in, in Tibet there's two sources of magic. The first is tu. Uh, tu means the uh, magical power in an individual, and that you develop through doing uh, uh, sadhana uh, uh, practice. And the other is sungma, or command over the uh, guardian spirits. And uh, this is emphasized in different degrees among the uh, uh, four uh, the Tibetan schools. But uh, <clears throat> the ultimate aim of doing sadhana is to develop siddhi. But there's two kinds of cities called uh, ordinary city and supreme city. Now, supreme city is the ultimate uh, spiritual goal. That is, realization of Buddha enlightenment and liberation from suffering and samsara. But for most of us here in this room, that won't be tomorrow or next week. Maybe not even this lifetime. It's down the road always. In the meantime, we need a little help from our friends. We have all our problems in life. So we also need ordinary cities. Now, of course, ordinary cities are not, not so ordinary um, because they mean like uh, psychic powers, like clairvoyance, telepathy, remembering your past lives, things like this, and so on. So that when Tibetan Buddhism which combines both the tantric traditions uh, coming from India with the shamanic tra traditions uh, found in Tibet. There is a lot of magical practice. Now, in some place like uh, the United States, which is infected with a, a sort of fundamentalist uh, uh, Protestant Christianity, uh, the word magic has a bad re reputation. Yes, of course, for centuries, the Christian church said all magic comes from the devil. Uh, and then modern science says there, there's no such thing. That magic is just um, illusions created on, on a, a stage. So, <clears throat> uh, Americans are often blissfully ignorant of how much magic the uh, Tibetans are actually uh, doing. They wonder, well, why, why are they doing all these rituals and why these long pujas and so on? Why just meditate? Protestants understand me meditation. You sit there still, especially if it's uncomfortable, uh, then it shows you're being very holy and Christian. Uh, <coughs> Well, they don't, uh, they don't see what these Tibetans are. But, and I saw uh, um, Catholics often understand this better, how ritual work with uh, energies and so on. And of course, anyone involved with something like Santeria immediately uh, sees what's uh, going on. But the whole aim of, of this is to better our condition in this uh, present life. Because uh, if you're there uh, starving and li living on the street, uh, especially here in Europe where it gets very cold, uh, your meditation practice is not going to be very good. So it's much better to have some uh, food and shelter and these uh, kind, of, kind of things. And so there are also spiritual practice taught by the Buddha and Padmasambhava and <coughs> other masters in the Buddhist and Bumpo traditions to better our condition in this present life. And this is also true of shamanism because shamanism not concerned with the ultimate goals of Buddha enlightenment and liberation from samsara, but curing our diseases, attracting prosperity, having a good relationship with the spirits, etc., etc., but this is also important in our relative condition. You can't just look at things from the absolute uh, point of view, because otherwise it's like someone walking along the street just looking in the sky and thinking, 
pure thoughts and not seeing uh, the manhole or the hole in the street in front of them. They fall down and break, break a leg. So that's why we also have uh, practical means to help us in this life. Okay, I managed to talk now until 8 o'clock according to my clock, and so uh, if uh, any of you now have some questions, uh, we can try and answer that, and uh, thank you for your attention. Have I reduced all you to silence? How do you remember all that? Oh, that's only the beginning. I could go on for hours. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for that. There seems to be quite a few correlations between the Tibetan huts, as you described, which you might want to with some Western ideas or Eastern ideas or any other different ideas. And I was wondering if you saw any textual connections or cultural connections between that or whether it's something else. Well, I take it mostly as archetypal co connections because if you look for wet Western Tantra, uh, you can look at the uh, ceremonial magical tradition that came out of the Renaissance, uh, coming initially from uh, Spain and from uh, Constantinople and brought to uh, it Italy. And there are many then similarities uh, in uh, our Western esoteric tradition with the uh, Tibetan tra traditions of Tantra. So something conceptual, no direct cultural link, something other than that? Uh, well, it was in the atmosphere, and people picked up on it. Yeah. I have two questions. So the first one is that um, the um, beginning of the story you mentioned that the monk is being Yeah. And how we go falling in love with this demon, female demon. Is, does it have anything to do with like, the very thing similar to? Well, kind of the male view of female evil which threatens them. Yes. <laughs> Something else archetypal. And what's your view on the, like, the relation between the new death experience and the human Oh, yeah. On the near death experience, you go to the threshold. And you may encounter some of these spirits then, but you're pulled back, you know. And, but there is the possibility of a soul journeying or journeying out of the body, where you enter then into the psychic atmosphere that surrounds our planet. And uh, sometimes it's you do it through... Shamanism, like with a drum and chanting, or taking certain herbs or things like, like, like this, and entering into an altered uh, state of uh, consciousness. And the uh, area closest to you is culturally uh, defined. You experience things within your own culture. And the same thing happens uh, after death, when you, you're first die and find yourself in a yilu, or mind-made body, you have karmic visions of uh, relating to your pre present life and culture and so on. But gradually you begin to wander off in the landscapes of the mind and uh, go f further away and have experiences from previous lives and th things like this. So. Some shamans have journeyed further than uh, uh, others uh, with the, this sort of thing. Just to hear the last question, um, you mentioned that 
how is it sustainable on well, uh, if you invite the spirits, uh, and this is done every, every Tibetan monastery, a Buddhist or Bumba, uh, they do a, a guardian puja, Dharmapala puja, uh, around sunset, because the spirits become stronger when the sun goes down and darkness comes. And then you invite them. And then if you invite them, there's two very important things. The first is to have offerings for them, whether uh, things that are actually present or visualized with, with the mind. Now, <clears throat> there's no problem with the great guardians who are manifestations of bodhisattvas. And whatnot. They are infinitely compassionate and patient. But it's the little spirits who come. Because the little spirits, they tend to be, shall we say, a bit emotionally immature. And it's like Children who come out in Halloween, and they come to your door, and they say, trick or treat. If you don't have the candies for them, they can make problems for you. So that's why you always have the puja offerings. And the puja offerings also, it serves as a bribe. You know, you're giving them payment to be good and to do, do good, good, good things. But it also represents an exchange of energy. Uh, the reciprocity between our human dimension of existence and the other world of the spirits. We give them energy in the form of these offerings. And then we can expect something in return from uh, them. So an exchange happens. The second principle is that uh, at least the head lama or officiant adopts a powerful form. Uh, for example, Mahakala. Uh, Mahakala kind of looks like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger from a Terminator film. And the spirits come see him, and they feel very intimidated, and they behave themselves, and they don't do anything uh, bad or mischievous. And uh, so uh, then you remind them of their promises that they made in the past to Padmasambhava or so on. What corresponds to this in the West is uh, like with the Key of Solomon, uh, which is a, a magical text from Renaissance time. Uh, the officiant or the magician creates a magical circle around himself for protection and then invokes spirits into the triangle of the art, which is outside your uh, circle. And the magician assumes the role of uh, King Solomon, because in the Jewish tradition, it said King Solomon had power over all the spirits because he knew their secret names and so on. He had that in his uh, book. Uh, Buddhist tradition, the secret names are the heart mantras of these uh, 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 Guardian. So you know that. Uh, <clears throat> then you're protected from whatever mischief they might do, but also you're empowered then to uh, request or command them to do different, different things. So this is, a, again, a, a, a similarity between uh, Western cer ceremonial magic and uh, what, what you're doing in guardian puja. Well, I think you, you have to ask them. <laughs> yeah. Do I have a what? Well, all right. Uh, before the 8th century, uh, because it ended in the 8th century with the conquest by uh, central Tibet when they incorporated the Zhang Zhengpas in their Tibetan army and so on. A uh, hundred years before that, they seem to have been 
uh, defeated also by the uh, king of central Tibet, Songtsen Gampo, who is regarded as the first Buddhist king. Uh, but it seems they continue to kind of as a vassal of uh, central uh, Tibet at, at that point. Uh, before that time, there's a, a list of 18 Jarochen kings and so on. But um, uh, there's said to have been an extensive uh, kingdom for several hundred years before that in uh, western and northern uh, Tibet. As I said now, uh, John Balates has been making a survey of all these sites and so on. Uh, <coughs> so now uh, scholars have become interested in this Zhang Zhang problem. Oh yeah, so Nagas come back on their UFOs now and then. <laughs> They're also very similar to the old gods of Ireland. My grandmother, who is uh, Irish, she told me that when she was a little girl, they would leave offerings of milk out at night uh, for the uh, Ishi, you know, the uh, the fairy people. And then when I was living on this ashram in India, I found the Indian ladies doing the same thing. And because the Nagas like milk. So, <laughs> okay, the old Irish gods <laughs> are like Nagas. And of course they said they, you know, when Christianity came, then they moved under the hills in Ireland and live there now. Yeah. Very quick and quick stop. And also, we're, um, we tend not to think that because there's climate change, because there's drought, because there's all sorts of things happening ecologically, <clears throat> we tend not, not to think in terms of um, a subset of the spirits. And, but yet, that's part of uh, Tibet culture, and there yes. are methods to. Yes. And the, uh, in the Buddhist point of view, particularly the lupum, we have made the nature spirits uh, sick, and they have become ill, and so then nature is becoming uh, chaotic and more uh, destructive. And if we don't do something about this, it's going to get a lot worse. Yeah. So, any ideas what we do? Well, I mean, what? <laughs> we, well, <clears throat> I mean, sure, we in our own practice, we can do med meditations and ri rituals and so on, which maybe helps uh, some, but uh, we are fighting how many billions of people now, and uh, the, of course <coughs> we're overpopulated, but also we have a big problem now, which are called politicians, <laughs> and uh, they're going to destroy this planet and the human race if we are not careful.
I mean, uh, this guy in the States now, he says there is no climate change. And he's taking the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement. And he says, I'm going to build coal-fired power plants throughout the United States now, revive the coal industry, because we need more CO2, not less. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, and also the amount of plastic that's uh, uh, appearing, but what's really frightening is the nanoplastic, you know, the very small particles that could even get into our cells, and no one yet knows about what influence that can have. So generally, uh, I feel this is the ax axial age. This is the biggest change in 10,000 years since the uh, Neolithic and the agricultural, the invention of agriculture and so on. And uh, now the bulk of human population no longer living on farms and, and so on, and in small villages. It's these huge cities. And, uh, but still the way we act and think is like from 10,000 years ago, uh, hunting and gathering. <laughs> And we're in trouble. I think big trouble. Okay, maybe we can. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. No, no, we'll close it down. People have to go on. Uh, there was a really fascinating documentary about um, shaman people from the Sierra Nevada in Colombia. And they talked about the relationship between energy and places and lines. Mm -hmm. Well, in Tibet, they built stupas in all these power places, which are connected. And there's two kinds of lines, the spirit lines that go straight, and the dragon lines, you know, meander through the uh, landscape. And you figure that out from feng shui or such a Tibetan word for, for this. Yeah. Uh, because they said in the beginning, uh, Tibet was this big uh, female rock ogress, and when she move about, it create earthquakes. And so to prevent that, you had to pin her down with all these stupas <laughs> to. And now uh, that system seems to be breaking down. 